China, home to one in five of the planet's population. The superpower the world fears, but few really know. Ken Hom is the godfather of Chinese food. Heaven on earth. He introduced the wok to the West more than 30 years ago. This is the way you should be cooking it. Ching He Huang is leading the next generation of Chinese cooks. I'm just going to chop up the head. With a modern, inventive approach to the cuisine. It's like ducks playing in springtime. Lovely. We're taking a once-in-a-lifetime adventure across China through food. Rabbit head. <laughs> Shall we try one? <laughs> to delve into its heart and soul. Thank okay. you. Pull it. Food is the best way to explore Chinese culture because we really live to eat. It's an epic trip. 3,000 miles from the mega cities of the east to the forgotten villages of the wild west. It's like we've been back to the time of Genghis Khan. <laughs> ah! <laughs> she, she's just decapitated it. <laughs> we'll uncover the familiar, the secret, and the surprising. Wow, I've never seen that done before. Cook simple and delicious dishes. That is my Sichuan sausage. And reveal the secrets of China, old and new. Oh, yeah. It's like a journey that I've always dreamt about, but in the China I've dreamt about. This time we're in Chengdu. It is one of the fastest growing cities in the world. In the interior of the country, it's always been an isolated place, free from Western influence and remains the most Chinese of China's megacities. Nearly a thousand miles from Beijing, deep in the heartland, in Sichuan province, Chengdu is known as one of the culinary capitals of China. The food here is the hottest in China and increasingly famous all over the world for its distinctive fiery flavors. Incredible variety, yes. We've come to Tengdu Spice Market to explore the explosive tastes that make Sichuan food so unique. This place is like the core, the heart, and the mothership of, of spicy Sichuan food. The people here are obsessed with chilies, claiming they have a medicinal quality driving out the cold, wet climate. And you really feel like trying all of them because some of them I've never seen before. I hope they're right because it really is damp here. <laughs> Even the seeds of the chili, which we tend to avoid in the West, are sold here as a garnish. <laughs> oh, they took the seeds out of the ones that are slightly yes. off color, that right. aren't as desirable. Oh my god. So that's a <laughs> that lot of chili. dry toasting. You would think this assault on their taste buds would be unbearable, but it's not all about chilies. <laughs> so big! Where do you start? There's a second key ingredient that absolutely defines Sichuan food. This innocent looking husk from the berry of the prickly ash bush is called the Sichuan flower pepper. It creates an incredibly intense numbing sensation that balances the chilly heat of the food. It stimulates the taste buds, unleashing an explosion of flavors. I don't know why I'm actually a little terrified of trying it, <laughs> because I've cooked with it so many times. Wow. Oh Normally my God. You wouldn't eat this. <laughs> it's really strong, really yeah. numbing heat, numbing. much stronger than what we have in the UK. Mm. It's these authentic local flavors that I've come here to cook with and master. The fragrance of lavender taste is unbelievable. I know, lavender and a little citrus um, spice to it. I haven't been here for almost 24 years, mm -hmm. and now I realize how much I just miss this fragrance. Mm -hmm. 
There are not many places in the world where cooking is so dominated by just a few key spices. We want to begin our exploration of these fascinating complex flavors where some of the most authentic food can be found. Here in these ramshackle restaurants hidden away in the alleys and back streets of the city. To help us track down one of the best, we've enlisted the help of Jenny Gao, a food writer raised in Canada but born in Chengdu. She's taking us to a restaurant in the old part of the city that's due for redevelopment. So this is the famous fly restaurant Ming Qing, and um, it started off just a couple of tables. But you know, as its popularity grew, uh, more and more tables were added. It, you know, as you see, it spilled out onto the street. Yes. Called fly restaurants, apparently because of their rough and ready approach to hygiene, these places have always been the soul of the food culture here. to cook in this kitchen, it's yeah. just chaos. Both sides. So it's got chili garlic. bean paste, yeah, chili it's bean got some garlic, and chili, and ginger. Yeah. Buffalo is the fragrance. Yes, the roar of the wok. How intense it is. Yeah. I'm desperate to cook with all these amazing spices, but first I want to taste how the chefs combine chili and citron flower pepper to create the distinctive numbing heat they call ma la. For all these dishes, you won't get like a very strong sensation of like, you know, very ma, very la. But eventually, after you start eating more and more, I you start feel to feel it. Like I can feel it. Out. Feel, feel it on your it. tongue and on your lips, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Oh, my mouth is on fire. One of the most famous local dishes is ma po tofu, a regional classic made with tofu and usually ground beef or pork. But here at Mingting, it has a surprising alternative ingredient. We're tricking you by putting in a little bit of pig brain in there as well. Pig brain? Pig brain. Pig yeah. brains with tofu. Yeah, dig in. Despite my dad keeping pigs when I was young in Taiwan, I'd never developed the Chinese love of brains. <laughs> That's a generous bit of brain. <laughs> oh my god, goodness me. This is a first for me. I've had, I can clearly say I've had probably all bits of offal. Yeah. But not brain. Not brain? <laughs> Feeling a bit uh, funny, actually. Yeah. Think of it as tofu. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, like how... Mmm. It's really creamy. Yes. Creamy. Yeah. It reminds me of like fragua. Absolutely. Pig brain is actually very popular in uh, Sichuan, as is the brain of a lot of animals. Yeah, I think I'll stick to the tofu. Yeah, the, really? Right. Mapo tofu is one of my favorite dishes, and I really want to test out the authenticity of my version on the chefs at Ming Ting. So I'm going to prep my ingredients here. So, Like many Sichuan recipes, garlic, ginger, chili bean paste, and of course a pinch of that ground Sichuan flower pepper are exploded in hot oil to release their fragrance. Like most of the dishes we'll cook on our travels, it's easy to do at home. It's a little unnerving, though, to have such an expert audience, particularly because I'm adapting the house special, swapping the pig's brains for Chinese long beans and pickled bamboo, although you could use leeks and shallots. Yeah. In with my beans. beans. In with the bamboo shoots. I'm going to season it now with a little bit of soy. In with the tofu. That looks absolutely beautiful. Thank you. you can get ground Sichuan flower pepper in Chinese supermarkets in the UK or online. And don't be afraid to experiment to get that balance with the chilies just right. Beautiful. Very <laughs> good. Mm. Very good. Very good. Very good. I love the atmosphere in this place, and it's heartening to see that traditional cooking is safe in the hands of these young chefs. And even though Ming Ting's present location is soon to be redeveloped, Chef Wu Jing and his staff are positive about the future.
he's going to um, just follow his boss and wherever his boss opens next, that's where he will go. Sichuan. Sichuan. Cheers, Cheers. The next morning, we've arranged to meet Jenny on the outskirts of the city. Chengdu is at the center of the government's Go West policy. It's invested $300 billion to spark an economic boom in Western China, on a par with Beijing and Shanghai. Can you imagine this whole area? Most of these buildings were not here. When I was here in 1989, it was still a fairly primitive place. Many of the streets were a little more than dirt roads, and people brought produce in from the countryside on carts pulled by donkeys. Now, Chengdu has a population of 14 million and the fastest rate of urbanization in the world. In the next decade, it's expected to increase by nearly a million people every year. There it is, that's the hotel. Oh, that's that is a hotel I stayed in. It was the tallest building in Chengdu. That's it. And you see now, it's dwarfed wow. by all these other buildings. Yes. And they keep building. Look how many cranes there are over there. Just amazing. I thought it would be a lot of change, but not sort of this much. It's shocking at the beginning because it's a sleepy backwaters here. You expect that from Shanghai and Beijing, but not from Chengdu. Jenny's been kind enough to invite us to her grandparents' home, where she spent her early childhood. My cousins and I used to come and we would, uh, you know, get together for family lunches, you know, dumplings and noodles. It's exciting for me, as I've always believed the best cooking is in the home. And a taste of family life is a great way to get beneath the skin of a city. Visit. So these are my grandparents. Oh. <laughs> my grandfather. Jenny's grandparents are in their 80s, and as is traditional in Chinese culture, one of their sons lives at home and takes care of them with his wife, Jenny's aunt. I love her hat. She says, Oh, 84. I'm sorry. Oh, 84. <laughs> My grandmother is chilly, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the reason why it's so cold indoors is right. because there's no central heating in Sichuan. So there isn't? <laughs> some of the Yangtze, uh, yeah. all of the provinces um, don't actually have central heating because I guess the government figures it's uh, not cold enough to need it. So do they wear coats indoors then? Yes, Every, exactly. When and it's in the winter, winter, everyone wears coats, mm -hmm. scarves, hats, the whole thing. Thank so God like, for the walk and cooking then. <laughs> well, Ching gets to know the family. I really want to see the local market and join Jenny's aunt on her daily trip to buy fresh ingredients. Most days she's here at the crack of dawn to get the best produce. She spends around five hours each morning shopping and preparing lunch for her family. I offer to help out with a dish of my own. More sausages. And I'm on the lookout for inspiration. It's a struggle though to understand the local dialect. So typical Chinese. You mean like this? Like this? Embarrassed. I've always loved markets, and in China, they're a particular pleasure. Chaotic, and despite the government's pledge to improve food safety, I can't see many fridges. Oh, oh did you see this the fish see? Live. Live. This is how Chinese want freshness. They want to make sure the fish is really fresh. Look at this. Uh, Fresh frogs. This is yu, and sun yu, sun yu, sun yu, okay. Turtles, of course. Sha. I spotted some rabbit, a specialty in Sichuan. The Chinese actually produce more rabbit than any other country. 
although they export most of it. What they've done is quickly blanch it in hot water and they pull the skin off, which is how rapid it's done. You would not see this in uh, Beijing or Guangzhou or, or anywhere I've been in China. I mean, duck, chicken, of course, you see that everywhere, but certainly not rabbit. And they just love it. It's a great protein, it's a sustainable food, and it was quite poor here, which is why they eat rabbit. While Ken's at the market, Jenny's grandmother is showing me her traditional method for making pickles. She first adds to the pickling water, garlic, chili and salt, and then uses a method I haven't seen before. Two types of rock sugar, a lot of citron pepper, and instead of vinegar, she's adding baijiu, a local 50% proof spirit, a bit like a sweeter version of vodka. Pickles are incredibly popular in China and are an easy way to preserve vegetables. When I was a child in Taiwan, I used to have them for breakfast with my grandmother. Jenny's grandmother always has a pot of pickles on the go, even today. Ah, oh, can't wait to try this. The pickling water is so strong that the vegetables are ready in just 24 hours. She serves them the traditional way, with a light drizzle of chilli and citron pepper oil, made from infusing hot oil with citron peppercorns. Mmm, that is delicious. It's so crunchy. I've got now the, the chilli, the numbing heat mm -hmm. of that citron pepper oil, and mm -hmm. a little sour from the pickle. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. That's the beauty Thank of you. Thank you. Thank you. As soon as we return, Jenny's aunt gets straight to work on the lunch. I'm making a simple rabbit stir-fry, but you could use chicken for this dish. I'm using a marinade of soy sauce, sesame oil, with a coating of corn flour. It's usually best left for a couple of hours to take effect. I'm cooking the rabbit with garlic and the less spicy green chilies as the flesh has a delicate flavor. What people outside of China don't know is that uh, even home cooks will heat the wok up until it's very, very hot before they add the oil. So I've heated it up for a few minutes now. This is good firepower. As you can see, it's smoking like this. Don't worry, you want this to be very hot you obviously have to be careful doing this at home. But if you pull the wok away from the heat, the flames will die down quickly. This is the way, actually, you should be cooking it. This is what gives um, Chinese food its very, very special flavor. It seals in the juices. Now, it's very important is to take all this now and drain this. We add the garlic and the chilies. And instead of adding more oil, which is a mistake a lot of cooks make when they're not familiar with Chinese, we just add a little bit of this broth I made from the rabbit bones. And at the very end, I return the rabbit. I'm only braising the rabbit meat for a couple of minutes. In the West, we usually aim for tenderness, but here people love chewy textures and really appreciate the feel of food in the mouth. Very Citronese then. While Ken cooks, I'm enjoying spending time with the family. I feel like I've come back home. Yeah, it's great. 
I grew up in a small village with my grandparents in rural Taiwan. And then, when I was five, left with my parents for South Africa. Finally arriving in the UK when I was 11 years old. When I was growing up at school, I was never proud to be Chinese. All I wanted to do was, you know, be English and why can't I be more like my English friends and I wanted to dye my hair blonde and, you know, be very Western. Now, Jenny should come and try some xiao tzu. Over the years, cooking has helped connect me to my Chinese roots. So it feels important to make something for Jenny's family that for them feels authentically Sichuanese. Watching Jenny's aunt cook is really inspiring. She's making a boiled fish dish. It smells good. Your aunt is a really masterful cook. And she cooks in high heels. It's amazing. I know. <laughs> it's really, it really is amazing. And so now she's sprinkling on the chili flakes. She's got some hot vegetable oil. Wow. That looks wonderful. I've never done it like that before. You know, sprinkle a dish with chilies and then just lay a little hot sizzling oil on top. It's just, it's beautiful. It's really, I'm learning so much. It's wonderful. I want to make a dish with traditional Sichuan flavors. I'm going to call it crispy, fragrant Sichuan sausage. This is about experimenting. I do like to improvise sometimes because that's what I do at home. First, I'm boiling some of Jenny's aunt's homemade sausages. And it is a Chinese cook's dream to have all these ingredients. Um, but I'm going to use the woodier mushrooms because they're going to be lovely and crunchy. Texture is always important in Chinese dishes, but if you like, you could use oyster mushrooms instead. I've been pointed to these lovely pickled chilies. I'm going to keep the seeds because I know his family likes their food hot. Now these look like spring onions or scallions, but they're actually xuan miao, which is the garlic shoots. The sausages should be ready after just 10 minutes of boiling. Uh, shape is important. It's all about presentation and also cooking techniques. Same applies for vegetables. If you cut them on the angle, you expose more surface area. They'll cook a lot quicker in the wok. In with the garlic, and then in with all the sausages. I'm going to wok fry the sausages first so they get a bit crisp. This is what my grandmother would do. Cook all the ingredients separately and then bring it all together. It takes a little bit more time, but it's going to hopefully be worth it. And I'm just going to add the vegetables in now all of them together at the same time. You do need to be careful, otherwise you'll set your hair on fire. The cooked vegetables are set aside and then inspired by Jenny's aunt's fish dish, I'm making a kind of hot oil dressing based on chili bean paste and Sichuan flour pepper. Mm, it's... Um, sour, it's spicy, it's hot, it's numbing heat. So what I'm going to do is just throw this all back into the wok and toss it all together so that all the flavours are mixed in really well. Okay. That is my crispy, fragrant Sichuan sausage with with your mushrooms, garlic sheets and pickled chilli. And it's so hot. It's so numbing heat. This is a true Sichuan dish, I think. This is actually blow your head off good. I think I could give some of the fly restaurants a run for their money. Oh. Jenny's aunt is treating us to the kind of feast the family only enjoys on special occasions. 30 or 40 years ago, they wouldn't have been able to afford so many meat and fish dishes. <laughs> it's an amazing spread, including the water boiled fish with its vibrant layers of hot oil, chili, and vegetables. Braised eel with green peppers 
and a delicious, unusual stir-fry shredded potato. This is better than any restaurant, I could tell you. Home cooked food. God, this is pretty impressive. With so much amazing, authentic food on the table, I hope I've pulled off a dish that delivers the right balance of spice and numbing heat. <laughs> I can have another drink now. <laughs> We're now three days into our stay in Chengdu. Our time with Jenny's family was a fascinating glimpse into home cooking. But the next morning, Ching and I are on the lookout for some authentic street food. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's just brilliant. That's fresh chicken. Western chains are moving in here. McDonald's has 28 outlets and 7-Eleven are planning to open a staggering 350 shops in Chengdu over the next five years. Even so, we don't have to look far to find some delicious Chinese fast food, like these traditional baozi buns. Should we get some pork yeah. buns? Yes, yeah. yeah. Made from steamed bread, they're an incredibly popular snack throughout all of China. We saw in Beijing, they have their version. Mm. Uh, everybody has their version. Um, yeah. It's sort of like a, our sandwich. Oh, it's just delicious. Mm. In Cantonese, we only have the barbecue pork with mm -hmm. no vegetables. Mm. And that was really nice. I mm. took it to school. People it's were so envious. Yummy. They had these horrible, like, cold cut sandwiches. and. I had this wonderful fragrance uh, bao. Do you know the Starbucks? Starbucks Cafe Ting. Starbucks Cafe Ting. No, she's not aware of it. She, does, she says she's never heard of Starbucks. Yeah. Even though China is modern, I don't think its food culture is in any way endangered by all these foreign fast food places simply because there's a tradition of eating things like this. Yeah. The real threat to authentic food on the streets of Chengdu is the redevelopment sweeping through the city. It's like a different planet. Yeah. They said China has half of the cranes in the world. As the old neighborhoods are torn down, many of the street food stands have been moved here to Jinli Street a purpose-built recreation of the old Chengdu. So this is really modernized It's now. modernized, but it's okay. Well, that looks good too. Like, they all look good. They all look good. This is Sichuan delicacy. Yes, it's that's right. It's a dessert, right? It's, it's glutinous a rice balls. Uh -huh. It's called uh, San Da Pao, Three Big yes. Bombs. <laughs> it's to attract people to come traditionally, oh. the sound of it. The theme park atmosphere seems to have done nothing to dent the Chinese enthusiasm for unusual and wonderful snacks. Like deep fried rabbit's head. Yeah. Shall we try one? <laughs> this is the rabbit head. Shall we try one? No. Yeah. No. Uh, I yes, so. I think we should try one. Come on. I want to try this because I've never tried it before. Eight. Okay, yeah. so eight yen. That's like eighty p. Smells good. See, it's. Oh, a, that's a proper skull over there. Well, there's not much no. meat on it except for. Mm, the cheek. Oh. You know what it tastes like? It tastes like okay. a little bit like a ham. She's saying and you should, should say, yes, um, uh, open, open this it up. like a crab claw. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. To reveal the meat. All right then. <laughs> Can I have one? The seasoning and the spices on it mm, are that's really what makes it really tasty, good. aren't they? Yes. And it does make something that is um, sort of a bit gross to eat. Yes. Delicious. That's cultural. If you yeah. grew up eating this, then mm. it wouldn't be disgusting. Now, you know what Chinese um, used to find disgusting when Westerners eat big slabs of steak? Mm. They found that really disgusting. My mother used to recoil. She was like, oh, God. 
how could he eat a big slab of cow like that? <laughs> <laughs> Ken may be keen on rabbit's head, but I want to show him what everyone in the city is really eating. It's a food tradition that will never be threatened, however fast the city grows, and it's one of the national dishes of China. This fiery, bubbling cauldron of broth is known as hot pot. You can order pretty much anything you like, but the catch is you have to cook it yourself. This is China's fondue, except they've been eating hot pot for thousands of years. Hello, hello. Bamboo shoots. It's fantastic how they slice it. There's no cooking here because all they do is prep, right? Right. Of course, this being Tengdu, they do a mean mala numbing heat version here, and I want to know exactly what goes into it. They make all their soup bases. Ni hao. Ni hao. Look at that pot oh, of Sichuan pepper. Wow. That's a lot of flour pepper. The copper hot pot is shaped like the yin and yang symbol to represent the balance of the mild broth on one side and the spicy on the other. So they put in dried chilies, and then he puts in the flour Sichuan pepper. There are many varieties of hot pot, but in this version, the yin side gets added flavor from a fish, tomatoes, and what looks like spam. It might seem a weird combination for Western tastes, but the buzz here is amazing. And it's clear that for the people of Tengdu, hot pot is just as important a social event as it is a meal. As if the hot pot wasn't already spicy enough, more stock and chili oil is brought to the table. That's a lot of chili oil. It's sealed in these bizarre clinical looking bags, apparently to reassure the customer that the oil has not been recycled, a practice of some hot pot restaurants. But now that the government's beginning to crack down on food safety, Reusing cooking oil has been banned. It is making me hungry looking at the spicy red sauce. It seems like we may have allowed the waitress to order too much food. But it was the heat from that lethal looking broth that I really wanted to try. <laughs> it's not what I expected. It's not as spicy as I thought it would be. Did you not? taste the numbing heat, it's kind of like a delayed reaction. It's a delayed like reaction. It, yeah. It's really spicy. Yeah, that's true. It's only when you say, oh, it's not hot, then oh. you go, oh. <laughs> that numbing spice is really addictive. Yeah, it is. Yeah. After suffering Chengdu's damp and foggy climate, I think I'm beginning to understand why everyone's obsessed with this unique combination of spices. I mean, it's amazing. The first few days when I was here, I felt my bones creaking. I thought, my God, I feel old for the first time. And I noticed since I've been eating this kind of food, my joints did not sort of creak the way they did the first day. The climate might be damp here, but it's contributed to the area around Tengdu being so fertile that Sichuan is known in China as the land of abundance. But it's not only crops, it also supplies over half the country's pork. My dad kept pigs when I was growing up, so I'm looking forward to visiting a local pig farmer. I'm hoping to try my hand at some traditional pork dishes. Mr Peng is different to most farmers in the region, because his pigs are organic. <laughs> Nearly three quarters of all the meat eaten in China is pork. To the Chinese, pigs symbolize virility, and traditionally, they've always been an important part of everyday life. Wow, they're really hungry. Hello! Uh, uh. 
And although the Chinese eat every part of the pig, they still get through nearly two million every day. With so much pressure to churn out pork, organic farming has not been a priority. So I'm happy to discover Mr. Ping is obsessive about his pig's well-being. He produces and mixes his own feed and has a radical and unusual approach to their health. Mr. Peng's business started slowly, but in the last five years, due to food safety scares and the expanding middle class, the demand for organic food has quadrupled. He's invited me to his house to meet his wife and to have some supper. In return, I've offered to cook a dish for them. Mrs. Ping's prepared a whole selection of different cuts of their own pork, which she's boiled for 30 minutes. And before I cook, she wants to show me some classic home-style dishes. Starting with a much-prized cold salad. It's funny, isn't it? Because back in England, pig's ears probably the cheapest, and people would don't want that and actually discard it or mix into dog food. But here, it's really prized and the most expensive part. Now she's got some baby spring onions. Before it can be eaten, the pig's ear salad needs to soak for a couple of hours in the spicy dressing, which is, of course, made with chilies and citron flower pepper. From all the activity, it looks like I'm in for more than the simple supper I was expecting. With typical Chinese hospitality, Mrs. Peng is preparing us a feast using every part of the pig. This is like a bridge, a bridge pork rib. It's a really wonderful way of steaming here. So you just put water at the base and then put a plate over the top. Their woks look amazing. This egg is not able to get out. Not able to get out. This is our natural egg. This is the 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 egg. Wow, how strong! I like this one. This one I like. Can you eat it? Oh, thank you. It's juicy. Really tender and very sweet. I'm planning to cook my hosts a dish using more of that delicious pork belly, a Sichuan classic called Twice Cooked Pork. Mr. and Mrs. Ping are clearly very particular about their food, and they both seem concerned that I won't stick to the traditional recipe. The light is used for seasoning, for saltiness, and then the dark is used for colour, to caramel. Now, there's so many different variations of Hui Guo Rou. She likes to use the Lao Chou, which is the dark soy sauce. But I like to mix a little bit the light and the dark. For my version of the dish, I'm starting with fermented black beans, mixing them with chili bean paste and frying the mixture in hot oil. Twice cooked pork is essentially a stir-fry dish, using slices of pork belly that have already been boiled for half an hour. I'm just going to add a little bit of the dark soy sauce 
and then a little bit of the light as well. A little bit of sugar. The last ingredient in, as they only need a minute or so, are the spring onions. He's so proud of you know the Sichuan classic classic hui guo rou. This isn't even good enough for him. Oh, it's salty, but it's it's not the real thing. But Mrs. Pen, for Mrs. Pen, she said it's good. Oh, how li hai ah. Mrs. Pen has made us so many classic Sichuan pork dishes, each using a different cooking method. Doesn't it look amazing? All the dishes together. 不会做，是只是一般的，我们每家的家庭妇女都会做。你说这种就是绿色的。Pen ah in. Dressing on the pigs is really good. And very crunchy. Cartilagey. But good. This is Mr. Ping's daughter. Actually, I'm going to ask her what she thinks of my hui guo rou, my twice cooked pork. You try it. I want to see how it tastes. Good. 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 <laughs> At least someone likes it. <laughs> as well as pork and flour pepper, there's another locally produced ingredient that Sichuan has made famous and defines the taste of the region. In the few days we've been here, everyone we've met has relied on it. If chili and Sichuan pepper are the heart of Sichuan food, then chili bean paste is the soul. This is incredible. I've never Oops. seen anything like this in my life. I feel like I'm walking into a cemetery or a monastery because yeah. it's so zen. It's a bit spooky and eerie. At this factory in Pishan, just outside of Chengdu, they've been making the best chili bean paste in the world for over 300 years. Oh, two years? This one's been yeah, yes, aged for? Years. Wow, they have three years and five years. The paste is actually very simply made from just three ingredients, broad beans, red chilies, and salt. It's then left to ferment in these earthenware crocks for up to five years. That is really Superb. It's beautiful. Mm. It's sour, spicy, beany. Just really intense. Yes. It's funny, I would never say this is chili bean sauce. Absolutely, and it's never this color no. anyway. So that yeah. just means that they haven't been aged as long. The quality can that we've been cooking with well, has been substandard <laughs> what we get back home. The secret of this paste lies in the relentlessly damp Sichuan climate. The humidity in the air helps the years of fermentation, creating a chili bean paste unlike any other. It's a little bit like wine. Mm -hmm. You know, when we do wine, we're talking about where the grapes come from, the terroir, what the French say. Right. And I think it's very much this, because this is uh, mm. the heart of what Sichuan cooking is about, this kind of damp, uh, foggy uh, climate that makes this kind of moody Rich chili bean, bean sauce, sauce that's the heart of this type of cooking. During our time in Chengdu, we've seen modern China pushing up against the past. 
But in the People's Park, the surrounding tower blocks are kept at bay, and certain traditions that stretch back centuries remain unchanged. Chengdu has a reputation as the most chilled out city in China. As the saying goes here, sunny days are rare, but tea houses are abundant. One thing I really remember about my mom is her love of mahjong. And she could sit for hours just drinking tea and just playing with her friends. I mean, you couldn't get her to pay any attention to anything when she's playing. I mean, she's like focused on that. Despite Chairman Mao closing down tea houses, because he felt gathering places posed a threat, they reopened in the early 80s, and the retired Chinese still come here to play. You hear the clack when they go like that. <laughs> yeah, when they shi pai, yes, they, they, right. they call it washing the tiles. The tile. Just as I'm beginning to relax, a stranger offers me the Chinese equivalent of a shoe shine. Oh my god, he's got a little <laughs> he's got a little flashlight yeah. on his face. <laughs> what does it feel like? Oh, Is it soothing? It's, a, um, it's not soothing, it's uh, very interesting. Whoa, that is a sensation. Oh, he's massaging your ears. Oh, he's massaging my ear, I love it. <laughs> While the rituals of tea house life may remain unchanged, and where once I would have expected to see the gentle rhythm of Tai Chi, today people are moving to a different beat. The dancing reflects a newfound freedom that I hadn't sensed when I came here in 1989. Then China was still emerging from a period of long isolation and the trauma of the Cultural Revolution. Mao's attempt to impose communist ideas throughout the country in the 1960s and 70s resulted in chaos and famine. Every aspect of life was affected Rationing was introduced, the art of cooking was abandoned, and many people fled the country. People like Chef Li. He escaped to Hong Kong when he was 18, but returned to Chengdu 10 years ago as life began to improve. Uh Wow, that is amazing. It feels good that Chef Li has returned to China. The influence of chefs like him has done so much to reinvigorate the food culture here. He agrees to give me a hand to make one of my favorite dishes, crispy aromatic duck. What we do in the UK is we take the duck and we would put things like five spices, Sichuan peppercorn on it and salt. But here is sort of the real thing. For the dry marinade, it's okay to improvise the ingredients, but the base usually starts with salt and chicken stock powder. And of course we're in Sichuan, so you have chilies. Lots of it. And then of course the most important thing are these lovely Sichuan peppercorns, really quite powerful. He said, put it all in. <laughs> the rest of the marinade, including cardamom, ginger, fennel seeds, and bay leaves are rubbed in. Then the duck is left for three hours to absorb the flavors. The trick to this dish is to steam the duck first for about 45 minutes, then to let it dry, and finally to deep fry it until the skin is crisp and golden.
Chinese like to gnaw on the bone because we feel that that's where all the flavor is. The marinade permeates the duck meat and that's what makes it red. Absolutely beautiful. Out of this world. It's much more complex than the aromatic crispy duck that we get in the UK. And it's funny, you don't even taste sort of the chilies and things like that, but it's a very sophisticated mixture of flavors here. Outstanding. <laughs> Sichuan province may be one of China's culinary hotspots. But no trip here is complete without a visit to see Tengdu's most famous residence. Oh my god, they're so funny! It's like they don't look real. They're so human-like. I think any moment someone's going to take the mask off and go, <laughs> I love the one in the tree. This panda sanctuary is home to most of the world's panda population. And here, at least, you feel that life will remain unchanged. Yeah, this, this was worth the trip here. Yeah. Pandas are a massive draw for Chengdu, particularly for Chinese tourists. But we have one last place to go. It's a place where our experience of Sichuan food traditions are brought together and elevated to a new level. Boy, I can't wait. <laughs> Yu's Family Kitchen is one of Chengdu's most celebrated restaurants. That's so beautiful. Little hedgehogs. The food is the work of this man, Chef Yu Bo. He's traveled the world, gathering ideas and inspiration for his cooking. And now he's receiving acclaim, both at home and abroad, for his modern twist on traditional Sichuan dishes. I haven't seen such an innovative approach to traditional food anywhere in China. It looks so beautiful, yes. I don't want it to I, I know. Because it looks like a work of art. These pastry brushes are filled with a sweet red bean paste. This is in Chinese, it is used in the blood of the blood. It is used in the blood. And it couldn't be a better demonstration of the new culinary confidence in the country. Wow. wow. Presentation yeah. is fantastic. It I can't is. wait to try it. It is a genius. Real genius. <laughs> 到就是國外去交流吧。This feels like an incredible opportunity to try out some of the cooking techniques I've discovered here on one of the best chefs in China. I want to use a traditional flavor combination unique to Sichuan. It's called Guai Wei. It's it's called strange flavor, and I say it's a combination of. Um, all these uh, flavors like the chili bean paste, some mm. sesame paste, right. vinegar, sugar, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of all brought together. So we'll just see how it's it goes. Like a dressing. It's like a dressing, right. it's exactly. Like a dressing. I'm kind of nervous because all the chefs here work with such precision, and my dish is a bit more rustic. My Guai Wei strange flavor salad will taste spicy, sour, sweet, and nutty. It's a take on a Sichuan classic, smacked cucumber. You just smash it, it just bruises it, it just starts to allow you to sort of put the flavors mm. together, you know, absorb flavors of dressings. It's quite a local way of uh, doing a, a salad. I'm cutting the cucumber into large pieces 
adding sliced mustard green hearts. Broccoli stems would work too. And some finely chopped garlic shoots to add at the end. For the dressing, the strange flavour sauce is actually a mix of icing sugar with black rice vinegar and light soy sauce. It's a sort of Chinese vinaigrette. To that, I'm adding some smooth peanut butter, which gives a lovely, rich, nutty flavour. And then, sesame paste. The vegetables are tossed in the dressing and the garlic shoots sprinkled on top. Laying the garlic shoots. Finally, the key regional flavours. Sichuan flour pepper and chilli bean paste, fried in hot oil to release the flavours. A trick I learned from Jenny's aunt, poured over the top. So it's sort of hot and cold. And to top it off, chilli wow. oil. Boy, cucumber <laughs> salad has never been the same. And more ground citron flour pepper. That looks lovely. How mm. sure. It's a nice, crunchy, refreshing texture. I expected it to be more hot. Yes, but it's not as hot as I thought it would be. Usually,我们没有用过豆瓣酱这样的 Oh, he said, mm. now that you've taught me <laughs> in future, That's I good. will definitely try. Mm. Wow. Oh, oh. Yes, Chengdu might be the fastest changing city in China, but our time here has been dominated by a sense of the traditional. Before in the past when I have come to China, I have felt a little bit mm, that I don't fit in. But this time, I feel a little bit more comfortable in my own skin. Cooking Chinese food, that's made me have a real deeper appreciation for Chinese culture. And I could definitely envisage myself coming to Sichuan and spending a lot more time here, and especially in Tendu. The chef here has taken things on another level. And I think we're only seeing Tip of the iceberg about what's really happening in China. Next time. Looks like an ancient medieval city. It's really on the far fringes of China. We'll explore a hidden side of China that feels distinctly un-Chinese. From the Wild West. This is like stepping back 2,000 years. To the tropical jungle. Look at that you can hear. There's some Chinese tradition I don't like. And find out how China's race to modernity is affecting these ancient cultures. Sort of a Chinese Disneyland.